Okay, I, I, I suggest we kick off. If, um, if uh, Jab, you're, you're ready, you're, if you're all ready. So let me um, introduce this uh, last uh, session. Uh, this for me is a, a, a wonderful opportunity of um, sharing again the experience of the, the Swahili Pot uh, Hub. Uh, we've heard from Espera, from ICROM, that uh, we have um, a series of hubs taking place around Africa. Uh, and together with the University of Cape Town and the Swahili Pot in Mombasa, these are the first two which are actually taking place. Uh, it was a great opportunity to having an incredible um, discussion, a preliminary discussion uh, earlier in the year. And uh, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity of actually speaking about that. The HUB is a non-profit organization based in Mombasa, focusing on inspiring and developing upcoming innovative technology ideas and art. You I'm over here. Training, support, professional mentoring, and coaching. And I think that uh, this really is modern heritage. This is exactly what it's about. And I said just previously, it's not just the aspirations of Africa, but it, the Swahili pot is the inspirations of Africa. So without further delay, we're going to be looking at the intangibility. And we've got, first of all, the first presentation by um, Rajab, and it's going to look at the interpretation of the modern heritage of Africa in the performing arts. And it's the case study of Swahili cultural music of Tara. So um, let's, uh, Rajab, you're off. And uh, Jacques, please, uh, um, first of all, Rajab, you want to, first of all, say a few words of introduction. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. My name is Rajab Salim from Swahili Port Hub, Mombasa, and I'm here to give a presentation on uh, Tarab. If you can show your, your video, it'd be great. Unfortunately, I'm not able to, to share the host. Should uh, The host should give me permission to share my video. No, no, your, your, your photograph. Sorry? Your photograph, we can see you. Video. Oh, my, my, my video. Your camera. I'm, I'm trying to put on my camera, but it says I need permission from the host. Ah. Are you seeing Look. that uh, from your side? Don't worry. Okay. 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 Ah. Yes. Thank you. Can you all see me now? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Michael. So, as I was saying, I'm here to present on Tarab. Tarab uh, is a genre of music popular in the East African coast, and uh, we'll get to see how modern uh, Tarab differentiates with the ancient Tarab. Yeah, so I can see my presentation is already up. If uh, so. Thank you. Shall we start and then you can, we yes, can please. open the discussion afterwards? Great. Yes, please. Yes, okay, please. Jack, let's roll. Tarab, also called Tarabu or Tarab, is East Africa's coast most popular music. Tarab is popularly known as Swahili wedding music since Tarab musicians and music are an essential part of these multi-day festivities. The East African coast has served as a center of trade with countries throughout the Middle East and Asia and Tarab music reflects many of the cultures which have passed through this region. Through its years of development, Tarabu has been an exceptionally inclusive art form, adapting and incorporating elements from Swahili, Arabic, Indian, Egyptian, and other cultures. This can be seen in the range of instruments used in Arab assembles and orchestras, which include 
Middle Eastern Oud and Dumbek, Indian Tabla, Western Electric Keyboards, and the Japanese Taishokoto, described as Banjo. Similarly, Tara rhythms reflect traditional Ngoma dances like Chakacha, Indian film scores, Cuban rumba, and various Zairean and East African dance music. Perhaps, most importantly, the Arab lyrics radiate with the elusive intricacies of Swahili poetry and showcase the beauty of this long literary tradition. The word Arab is of Arabic derivation and contains multi-layered meaning. Gilbert Rogate in Music and Trance explains the Arab comes from the verb Tariba, which means to be moved, agitated, also signifies to excite, to want to move, and hence to sing, to make music. Historically, the Arab was first introduced to Zanzibar in 1870 by the Sultan Said Bargash, who brought a group of Egyptian musicians to his court. Bargash sent a Zanzibari musician Ibrahim Mohammed to study in Cairo and upon his return he formed the Zanzibar Arab Orchestra. In 1905 Zanzibar's second music society Ehwani Safa Music Club was established and continues to thrive today with around 35 active members. Ehwani Safa and Culture Music Club founded in 1985 remain the leading Zanzibar Arab orchestras. Tarab's first modern superstar ascended in 1928 with the Swahili singer Siti Bintisad, who appeared on hundreds of the 78s, many of them recorded in India. Unlike the majority of Tarab, which was sung in Arabic, Saad sang in Swahili and presaged a change in the direction of the music. After her death in 1950, Tarab lyrics became prominently Swahili and more female singers appeared with formerly all-male musical clubs. Another dramatic turn occurred with the revelation of the 1964's political push to de Arabicize the island and its cultural institutions. Some Arab clubs switched from Arabic to Swahili names, although many have reverted back, and musical societies were fully opened to women members. In this presentation, we are going to look at two different songs of Tarab, ancient Tarab and modern Tarab. We are going to look at the late Professor Jumabalo and a young star, Badi Star. Let's listen to this song from Jumabalo, termed Gunia. Namari Fuenzango Piano Te Juani Nalo Guni Alanguli Meni Shinda Yamani Natanga Naudi Mengum Tukuzi Simuani Tukuadi Nani Tukuadi Nani Avesai Kudi Beba Guni Ayo the late Jumabalo, or Professor Jumabalo, as many called him, is indeed a professor of Tarab. Jumabalo are traditional musicians of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and now the millennium has been able to maintain this position as the king of Tarab, owing to his poetic Swahili songs. They are food for thought and they touch on people's lifestyle, love, and misfortune. His art has been influential to many up and coming groups in Kenya and Tanzania countries which are home to a large number of Arab singers. What makes Balo's songs unique in his golden voice and the manner in which he crafts the lyrics, they are poetic 
and a mishmash of languages spoken in East Africa. He has a gift of coming up with on-the-spot lyrics while performing live on weddings. This Gunia song you have just listened to, the late Professor Jumabalo was talking about Gunia, which is a sack, but that was not the intention or the message in the song. He was talking about a person who cannot be tolerated or a person who is a nuisance to the public, a person that has very bad habits. Balo compared the person who is a nuisance to a sack that cannot be carried. The song is a hit till now. Gunia. We now get to listen to a piece of modern Arab, a song loved by many, youth and the elderly. A song by the star himself, the famous Badi star. The song is called Nampenda Kwaishara, which basically means he loves a lady but is afraid to speak. He only shows his actions. Song that we have just listened to, Nampenda Kwaishara, but is talking about a lady that he happens to love but cannot speak, just showing actions. Will the lady fall for body? It's a hit that is loved by many in the East African coast of Zanzibar, Tanzania, and Mombasa. In the two songs we've just listened to, we are seeing differences between modern and ancient Tarab. The instrumentation and style of singing, the rhythm, and of course, the instruments that are used. For example, in modern Tarab, we've had the, of the piano, the rhythm guitar, the bass guitar, and the drum set. In the ancient Tarab, there was the violin, the oud, the bamboo flute, the Dambuk, the Kanun, which are ancient, ancient Tarab music artists, include B. Malika, B. Kidude, Maulid Juma, Issa Matona, Sabah Salum, and the late Professor Jumabalo. Modern Tarab musicians include Mze Yusuf, Hadija Kopa, Leila Rashid, Esha Mashauzi, Badi Star, Kilimanjaro Band, amongst others. Tarab, which started in the early 1920s, still remains to thrive and to be loved by many in the 21st century. Thank you. Well, um,
Um, you're seeing that we're only a dozen of us. Uh, you're all welcome to put on your cameras. Uh, even Jack, uh, we can. Uh, you've got some comments to make on that. We're very happy to have you on board. So I think that uh, this has been really amazing because I think that of all the things that music is the way that we can really try to understand exactly um, the issues of modernism, exactly how it is then interpreted, the improvisations which are taken on board. Um, so perhaps uh, if we're, we would like to um, ask any questions before we sort of kick off onto a, some discussion about this. Shahid, you, you thought it was okay. No, no, no. I, uh, it was uh, excellent. Uh, I said good presentation. Uh, by good, I mean really good because it spoke also to the, the, the previous presentation before lunch where another genre of uh, Swahili music was, was, was looked at and in relation to uh, liberation songs um, and the, the influence of, 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 there was a lot of debate around what is the influence of religion in contemporary modern 20th, 21st century music. Um, and, and it's an open debate, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think that what is also interesting is that the change of which Rajab spoke about, the change of instruments, in other words, uh, we can take the music and through new instruments, if we were to take about architecture, taking new materials, exactly how we would do it. So I think that the music has actually um, taken a step forward to reinterpreting and using it. And I think that we did speak in the discussion at the Swahili Hub about the issues of music and about jazz, how in fact jazz then took on a dramatically um, global effect of which Africa had a major role to play. And if we speak about what are the aspirations of modernism and aspirations of what we're talking about is then how in fact the global globalness of this within Africa is going to be related to. Shadrach, you want to say something? Are you okay? Uh, can I say something? Yes, I please. Can. Yes, and now, now that uh, the Tarab music has a lot of uh, uh, proverbial uh, words uh, that they're calling mashairi. And, and you find that uh, like, because uh, what they said is it's a we wedding uh, ceremony uh, music. Uh, the music that is celebrating uh, the, uh, a certain wedding or a certain uh, event, wedding event. Now you'll find that some of the words that are used, the Swahili words that are used, are normally kind of hidden to be able to kind of hit maybe. Like you see, the Muslim community is a, a polygamy uh, uh, kind of uh, marriages that are there. And so if I have uh, two wives and if they meet in a wedding, when they hear a song that is a uh, Kind of, kind of directing uh, uh, some some uh, words uh, towards the other uh, the other spouse or the other lady, then she will even come out and dance uh, quite vigorously to be able to show the other ladies that I'm the one uh, uh, who's in charge, <laughs> and and, and uh, so so it's quite interesting because it brings out the, the, the celebrations, and and you find that when the other music now comes and hits the other lady who was uh, celebrating, this other one would come out with friends and. Uh, you know, make noise about it. And so it is quite uh, uh, informative, quite, uh, there's a communication that goes on. And there normally it's, it's a kind of a proverbs that are thrown out there to be able to hit uh, uh, some of the, of the ladies and all that. So it's, it's a very interesting kind of music. Would, would you say that this is um, African music, uh, Rajab? Uh, yes, uh, Michael. Tarab, now that it, it originates from the East African coast, uh, it's African, though so it's, it's popular only on the coastal line uh, in, in East Africa. So but, in East, but you East said, African coast- But you said it is really, it is syncretistic. It, it is takes on board then uh, Islamic uh, ideas. It came from Egypt, it took on, yes. it sort of it, it merged it. So um, when we talk about a particular identity, are we willing to accept 
a syncretistic uh, um, structure about that. It'll say, okay, well, I'm not just simply taking something historically which came evolved within just the uh, the space of the Swahili coast, but I'm willing to say, okay, no, it is taking on board lots of other influences. How would that also relate then to issues of colonialism? Uh, yes, Michael, uh, just as you said, and uh, like I had said earlier, uh, Tarab uh, was influenced a lot by uh, Arab music, Indian music, uh, from Egypt, uh, from Zaire, from Congo, which is that is Central Africa and North Africa. And uh, actually right now, some part of North Africa in, in Oman, Tarab is very, very popular. So it, 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 it's true that uh, colonialism really played a very big part uh, to influence the music uh, in, in the different uh, so countries. What would you say therefore that this sort of colonialism in music, which mm -hmm. we are willing to accept, as opposed mm -hmm. to the colonialism in architecture, which we're questioning, is this mm -hmm. because of eye level? In other words, the music has eye level, which is therefore creates a different relationship. Why is it that in music that I can, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to take on board um, all this, uh, this new structure and then repackage it as, uh, as uh, uh, African or Swahili Swahili music. Shadrach, you've got the, your violin there. You're part of the old group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I have the, the violin. Uh, it was played by one of my friends and um, yeah, he gifted it to me. So I put it in my house so that I can be remembering you, yeah. So um, we feel that we feel comfortable with um, external influences in music. Which, Shahid. Hey, Shahid. Ah, yeah, I keep on forgetting to unmute. 18 months after starting to use this damn infernal thing, I still forget to unmute. Um, oh, it, what is interesting, of course, is that you have this Arab influence, which is um, the spreading of an Islamic empire across the Indian Ocean. And that frames the initially the formation of this particular kind of music. Because it's not to say that societies that existed before that along the East Coast did not have music. So there's this interesting combination that takes place. Uh, and then much later on, almost 900 years later, the Portuguese, um, the, 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 the Portuguese, the Spanish, the, the, and, the, and the English, but mainly the, the Brits and the, and the, uh, the, the Portuguese arrive. And they provide a new colonial framework within which to, this to take place. So the empire is one kind of way in which these influences take place. But at the same time, internal to, to the African continent, there's this uh, influence that's going between Congo or what is today Congo and the coast. Uh, from what I understand from the previous session uh, before lunch, um, there always was this. But uh, it, in the 20th century, this takes on much more, particularly uh, when Congo was uh, Zaire, the, the influence of Lingala music or musicians coming to Mombasa and then going back to the Congo and then changing the music and then it coming back across to the coast. So there's this multiple ways in which this music is formed. So I, I'd like people to, the musicians, uh, to sort of comment on that. And the second one that, I'm, that really interests me is how this music um, is, is, I mean, um, uh, Rajab talked about the, the use of proverbs and proverbial words, but embedded within what he is saying is that 
uh, the music is situational to specific kinds of, or categories of performance. It might be a ritual, it might be sacred, it might be a wedding, uh, it might be in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a music or jazz club. And that it, it cuts across a, a range of different, um, how will I say, uh, what the word used in the previous session was a range of people that consume this kind of music. And this is what interests me is that the music is not static. Here is an example of change taking place constantly. And we heard from Isha Lawson's um, video, if that is a indicator of modernity, then we've had modernity existing on the East Coast for a long, long time, well before the European colonial empires. Thank you. Well, that's really, I, just before we move on to the second one, I would just like to say another aspect of it. In other words, you spoke about the wedding. In other words, it's music related to place. Okay, there's certain things which is, it's just can take anywhere, it's in my head. I can walk away with it. But there's certain things which relate to place. And I think that this is something which is, because we speak about, yes, we must have intangible heritage, we've got to put it on. But if we can't find the structure by which we link them together, then we're just going to have like two separate things and we're just going to give like um, statements. So I think that um, uh, well, are there other places where it would take place this sort of music? You speak about the wedding, so that is obviously place related. Are there other times or places that this music will take place? Uh, yes. Michael, uh, just like uh, I said earlier in the presentation, uh, at some point, uh, Tarab also gets political. It's used uh, during political campaigns. Uh, politicians use Tarab bands to, to campaign for themselves. One, because uh, uh, Tarab has a lot of fans. So when bands play Tarab music, uh, talking about a certain politician, by default, the politician gets numbers behind him or her. But also there has been some Arabs played after certain uh, incidences. Uh, for example, there was a time there was a very huge uh, inferno in a place called Faza in, in, in Lamu. Uh, and a Arab was composed Poleni Ndugu uh, Faza, which means uh, condolences to our brothers and sisters in Faza for the that has befallen you. So the Arab is very uh, situational. And uh, I think Raphael can also add on that. He's, I think he's that, been uh, um, in, in the coast for quite long. I think that, uh, well, I just look at uh, what uh, um, uh, Shahid has written and uh, also um, Purity. Do you want to make a mention now, Purity? Sure. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can hear you. Sorry, Absolutely. I had to join Group B for to just give some morale to Fatma. Um, but I was glad to listen to Rajab and his presentation, which was uh, very good. Um, and I'm just wondering, because um, you gave us quite a number of uh, musicians whom you think are more modern in terms of Tarab, including um, Copa, what's her other name? Anyway, I know her as Zuchu's mom. And I was just wondering what then would you consider Zuchu's music if her mom is modern? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Purity, for that. Uh, you, you're talking about Hadija Copa. Hadija Copa is a, is, a, is a veteran in the Tarab field. She's been there uh, from the 80s uh, till now. And Zuchu is her daughter, just like you said. But Zuchu is not doing Tarab. Zuchu does bongo flavor, which is another genre of uh, music popular in Tanzania. Um, further to that, and also what Sh Shahid was saying, yes, uh, is do you get new lyrics taking place? In other words, the music remains the same, but then the music is then hijacked for political reasons, hijacked for 
uh, social aspects. Is there? Is this takes place? Is this accepted? Do we accept that? Uh, it has been embraced by many. Uh, just like I, I had said earlier, the Arab uh, genre has a lot of funds. Now, for example, when politicians use Arab bands to campaign for themselves, of course, they change the lyrics, but the, the type of music, the instruments that, that are used are still the same. So it's Arab, but for political reasons, just changing the lyrics. Yeah, well, that I mean, people would do that because they want to try and build on the past, but then create yes. new ideas. Well, that, yes. that is really an interesting part of which actually takes place, um, uh, which is perhaps we need to uh, internalize this about how we can then redefine uh, the modernism. I think that it's much more, has much more subtleties, which of the intangible about actually taking on board these changes. Okay, I think that let's uh, move on to the visual arts and then we'll come back to it and try to bring it together. So um, we now have, um, uh, right, Raphael, it's now the influence of cultural heritage on the visual arts, or perhaps we should say influence of the visual arts on cultural heritage, I don't know. Anyway, we will talk about it in a minute. And um, I think we've got Jack to help us um, put the video on the screen. Art is a visual object or experience created consciously through expression of skill running all the way from dance to the visual art that we see. There are two types of art. We have the traditional art, which included wall art and the contemporary art, which is the modern art done by the modern visual artists. The main purpose of doing traditional art was to please God, intimidate enemies and to keep records. Visual art has helped in understanding and appreciating culture and heritage. Vigango, olden sculptures used by the Giriama for culture preservation. Handcrafted Swahili doors, which have influenced the modern type of doors which are used in modern architecture. Giz art found at the For Jesus Museums of Kenya, which helps in interpreting the history of the place. Modern artists use art to campaign against emerging issues such as environmental pollution and climatic change. Institutions like the For Jesus Museum have offered space whereby young children and adults can practice visual art to express their ideas. Thank you. That was really short and sweet. Shadrick, I saw that you appeared there on the screen. Yeah, so um, I'm the artist who has done the, the paintings which are on the screen, yeah. Do you want to say something about, uh, about um, are they modern or traditional? Okay, um, I can say just what something uh, to the video. First, uh, let me start with the traditional kind of art. The traditional kind of art was uh, owned by the community. Like, uh, as you have seen, we have the Vigango from the Giriama community. So um, they, they were found in the Mijikenda Kayas, which were, which were owned by the elders. And, the, and some also were, were placed at the tombs of uh, people who have died. So they, are, they were used to, like, uh, keep record of events, like people who have died. Yeah. So the, that kind of art was owned by the community. But we have the, now the modern kind of art, like uh, the art which I do, like what you have, done, what you have seen, which is uh, mainly uh, attributed to the artist, like uh, it's the, art, the artwork is done by the artist. Yeah, and uh, mainly the kind of uh, artwork, um, at some times they campaign for social activism, like uh, climatic change, like um, FGM, pollution, yeah, so. We, so are you saying do. therefore that the traditional, uh, uh, traditional is owned by the community and the modern is owned by the artist? Yeah, most of the traditional artwork was owned by the community. Like the Vigango, 
was uh, the Vigango kind of uh, artwork was owned by the Giriama. Then you, you find like the the doors, like I can let, let me talk about the sculptures. You find like uh, there are there is some kind of uh, carvings which was done on the doors, like that one was owned by the Swahili. Then you also find like some masks, some sculpture like masks which are owned by a certain community. Yeah, like um, from the community I come from, which is the Kamba community, we have some uh, kind of uh, particular masks which are owned by the community, which uh, symbolize uh, particular things like gods, events, yeah. Before I ask Raphael to add to that, Rajab, would you say therefore that traditional music is owned by the community and the modern is then owned by the performers? Would you say uh, similarly as Shadrick is saying? Uh, some, some pieces or, or some songs of Tarab, I can say, are owned by the community, but some, I'd say, are owned by individuals since the individuals are still alive and they still perform uh, their music by themselves. So there's that difference for the ones that maybe died, like an example is Professor Juma Balo, he died, uh, but his music is owned by his children. They, they produce his music to date and they sell his music. So it's not owned by the community, but other composers that probably died, like Siti Bintisad was the first female uh, singer of Tarab. I, I was more thinking not just sort of like legal ownership, but in fact sort mm -hmm. of like um, a more of a, a greater understanding of ownership. And I think Shadrick is very highlighting this issue is that like modern art, we speak about sort of Picasso, okay, we don't, yeah. but we wouldn't, um, uh, and at what time that we speak about, no, this is community, this is the traditional about it. And that's why I'm thinking about, do we have a similar thing when we speak about music as well? In other words, the traditional is that this belongs to the community. This is something which can take place. And uh, as opposed to the individuality of, uh, of the modern interpretations. Yes, yes, I, it's, it's the same. It's the same with music. Tarab also belongs to the community. Not, if it's not the legal aspects, it's the same. Yeah. Okay, Rafael, so we want to hear all ab about, uh, about you putting this together. Yes, uh, okay, let me, I was unmuting myself. Yeah, that's quite true. What uh, Shedrock is saying is that uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a, a shift uh, between uh, from uh, the, the, the traditional art and the contemporary art, because the contemporary has, is bringing in some new meanings. And this comes in, for example, in, in the case of the traditional art that we just saw, the Vigango. These are spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual uh, kind of poles that are placed uh, or, uh, at the sides of the homesteads of the Giriyama or the Mejikenda. These are the Bantus at the coastal strip of, uh, of, of Kenya. And, and these ones are to please the gods or to please the ancestors and sometimes to appease uh, the, the spirits. So you'll find that uh, there is a reason why uh, that particular art uh, has been brought up. And the traditional, uh, the, the Mejikenda feel like they own that particular uh, art. And when, but when it comes to the contemporary art, you find that now these new artists who are coming, like Shedrak being one of them, uh, would be putting in some new meanings because they have some expression they want to give to their art to be able to communicate uh, to maybe the, the, the public or the people uh, uh, as a whole. The, the, the other influence, like uh, what the topic says, is the influence of art by culture, is that there are some things that happen uh, every day around uh, some communities. And you'll find that uh, some artists would rather be drawing about uh, animals. Like I noticed that Shedrak likes drawing wild uh, game animals. Why? Just because he was brought up around uh, that particular uh, environment, the habitat of the wild animals, the lions. The... So, so you'll find that the artist wants to bring in some kind of new uh, meaning to whatever act that was there. Now you find that the, tra the, the traditional one were, had some function uh, kind of, but there are some influences that are coming in. Like even sometimes you find the, the artists want to intimidate their enemies, for instance, uh, or maybe they want to, this, this would be kind of traditional where maybe this uh, 
clan wants to intimidate the other clan by putting up some kind of uh, spiritual uh, things or something that will scare them away. Uh, in terms of uh, you know African uh, traditional uh, cultural practices. When it comes to uh, the, 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 the other aspects of the doors, like you said, the, the, the doors we always have, if you come to Mombasa, Shahid one time said he came to Mombasa and he saw quite a variety of uh, architecture of the doors. It's quite true. These doors would even tell you, like this is a door from Zanzibar, uh, this is a door from uh, Omani, or this is a door from, um, uh, from Malamu. So there is a lot, but those, these are traditional doors. One will tell from the architecture of that door that this is a particular door that has come from Lamu. But today we have some contemporary doors that are being carved by uh, young, young, young men who have learned a, a lot about the, the, the carvings. And so they bring, they infuse, they come and come up with a fusion of the Arabic style and the, the, the local East African style and put it together to come up with a very beautiful uh, door, which of course uh, signifies a lot in terms of uh, wealth or status of a community uh, or maybe an individual who is uh, living in that particular house. Because this uh, type of doors normally would uh, showcase uh, how important that person is or how rich uh, that person is. But there's a lot of communication in those doors uh, in, such, uh, in such a sense that there is some inscriptions that are carved out on top of those doors. And these are from the Quranic verses. And the belief is whoever is coming into the house should be able to, uh, if, if he has an, a bad intention, then he, that intention will be stopped at the, at the doorstep because of that Quranic verse that is just above uh, that particular piece. And now you see the contemporary artists now have come up with other doors which do not have those kind of details that you see in the traditional doors. You find that they just look at the patterns, create something that uh, is similar, but very beautiful in terms of uh, the creativity. Uh, the other thing about, uh, about art that you looked at, the, the, the visual arts is that they also interpret a history of some particular places, like uh, the drawings that we have in For Jesus. These were done by the Portuguese, who at some point were, uh, were under siege. The, the Omani Arab uh, naval ships had surrounded the fort and they laid a siege. So during this period, the soldiers inside the fort were quite uh, you know, idle, kind of uh, scared, and they were doing nothing. So they had to express whatever feelings they had on the, on the walls. This is what we, we call the rock art. And so later on, of course, when uh, the, the museum was opened up, this art was transferred into a room and displayed, showcasing what uh, feelings these uh, particular soldiers had. For example, you'd see sailboats uh, of the two different uh, cultures, that is the uh, Arabic uh, culture and the Portuguese culture. You'd also see soldiers fighting. You'd also see broken hearts, which shows the families who are far away from, from their homes. Uh, and so this also is, is quite a, a very good historic uh, uh, painting that was done simply, it was not even three dimension, it was just uh, two dimension, but it would communicate to whoever uh, would look at that particular rock art. And so uh, this also inspires and influences uh, people like us who are working in the museum to uh, uh, influence the young kids and invite them into the fort let them see the fort, see the doors, see the art that is in the fort or wherever uh, the art is. And then they also create uh, their own uh, kind of art. And you find that now these kids who are talented will bring out some very important uh, and very beautiful uh, pieces like uh, what we have experienced uh, with, uh, with Shedrach uh, very uh, lately. And uh, this is a program that normally uh, really brings in youth and uh, gives them some passion when it comes to coming up. So that influence, I would say, would really bring the traditional, uh, the difference between the traditional or the, maybe the traditional art and the contemporary art, which you can call the modern art. I hope I didn't uh, take yeah, that. No, time. Bef uh, before we move on, but I think that um, uh, we're seeing that both music and art are not, um, are not being threatened by these colonialism. And that's why I'm thinking about this relationships of eye level, which is so important. But I'd like to ask Purity, she's in the National Museums of Kenya. What would she be 
put on a, an exhibition of modern? Would that be, um, would she just have just modern art in, uh, in a museum exhibition? Uh, would just have as a subject? Would the subject of actually being putting the tradition and modern together in one exhibition, has, have, do we have experiences of that, Purity? Um, I, I don't think it's intentional, but most of the pieces that we have in most of our museums uh, carry both. They carry both the traditional and the modern. And uh, we've never really gone deeper uh, to be able to, to differentiate the two, but it just comes out automatically because you cannot divorce the two from one another. Because like, for example, even when you look at the sculptures, people who make sculptures, they still have some form of traditional in, in whatever they do. Um, and I was just pointing out, um, for example, to the Vigangos that uh, Raphael and Shadrach have talked about. I saw a few pieces just two days ago, somewhere in Malindi, which have taken, they are still traditional uh, kind of carvings of the Vigangos, but then they have small alterations, some aspects of small alterations, uh, like for example, using metal or just using bone, um, to define and to give them more um, meaning according to the artist who is making them. And even in our museums, like even in Nairobi, uh, what we have on the exhibitions are just pieces which carry both traditional uh, elements and also modern elements. And, and uh, the, the other thing that maybe Raphael and Shadrach have not talked about is the commercialization, uh, which is being done by the artist because, um, Today, the purpose, um, even though it's, it's more about expression and uh, uh, giving history, there's also that aspect of um, using art for livelihood. So you have to think beyond to be able to commercialize whatever aspects you are making, like for example, the Lamu doors. Um, when Raphael talks about the youth now coming up with new alterations on the Lamu doors, is to be able to appeal to people who can buy them and also be able to make them quickly for commercial purposes. So that aspect of commercialization has also uh, changed traditional art to modern art. Um, I think this is also very important about then the commercial purposes. Was traditional music and traditional art commercialized? Because Shadrach, you spoke about that it was there for the gods. Okay, uh, I can say it depends with the, with the kind of art uh, which was being uh, made. Uh, like, uh, I can say like some was uh, some kind of art, traditional art was commercialized, like you can find the beadwork. There are some people who are trading their beadworks with uh, other, kind of, uh, other kind of items. They are doing uh, some, um, some kind of uh, butter trade. Yeah. So let's, I think a similar thing, and we spoke about then music being uh, also in my head and I can walk away with it or uh, at a particular event. Uh, I think that the art forms are really powerful about things which I can move away with and those on the walls. Okay, those are part and parcel of place, which, or again, how politics has hijacked. Art is a very, very powerful political um, political weapon, tool, uh, medium, I don't know what we would call it, um, as, uh, as we spoke also to music as well, being taken over is that if I'm a political person, I will take over a background piece of music and then put my words to it so as to really sort of to get the people on board. I mean, that, that really is the way that one would do it. Um, purity. Yeah, and I think also uh, listening to Rajab's um, presentation in terms of the music, um, he gave us two musicians, one traditional and one modern. And if you listen to the um, particular message from both of those musicians, uh, music, it was very different. It was still Tara, but the message was very different. The first person was talking about, I think, the morals, 
it's, it's the one which was about a sack. So most of the traditional music was more about moral and the society in general. And then when you move now to the modern music, it, it's it's about, I don't know what I can say because the, the second artist was talking, it was more about love and issues that maybe relate uh, to the younger generation. And uh, those are things that we also need to think about because even with the um, Congolese kind of music, there's still that aspect of the traditional Congolese had very good messages, but the modern may not have as good messages as it had before. So I don't know, maybe we should try and see how maybe we can um, bring back the social fabric and the society back to the music and the messages that well, we are. That, that, that's really very interesting. We'll give uh, Rafael to speak next and then Rajab to, to reply. But um, I was at um, uh, a series of um, uh, exhibitions and uh, involved in uh, um, laboratories for dealing with arts at the National Gallery. And there the exhibition was not of um, Leonardo da Vinci, but the exhibition was exactly what was the context, what were the materials being used, and not the paintings. And so there's another way about uh, actually how we then internalize then the how in fact the visual arts and part and parcel of our context and cultural heritage. Anyway, Rafael. Fine, I think what I wanted to add is uh, uh, exactly what my, what I wanted to say is uh, exactly what Dr. Priti has said. Uh, but what I wanted to add is you look at this music, uh, Rajab said that the music, uh, the instruments that were used in the, the, old, uh, the traditional music or the old Tara, is different from the, the instruments that are being used now. This applies to art. When you look at the material they use in terms of uh, the contemporary art, or like the doors we just talked about. Uh, initially, the doors were carved out by hand with some uh, chisels and all that. But you see, nowadays, uh, because of the commercial aspects, they would want to make many doors. And so they use some machines, which would now carve out, the, I mean, carve the pieces and they make them so far. So that is quite different from the original uh, woods that were used and the carving uh, style that was used and even the tools uh, that were used in that particular aspect. And uh, the other thing about the music I wanted to add is that there's this aspect, uh, Rajab will also uh, agree with me, is that there is the dance aspect. These women, when they go for the mm. tara, they, they, they bring out some kind of a dance and they showcase how uh, nimble or how good they are in uh, in dancing chakacha, and it becomes a, a quite uh, some interesting uh, show uh, in terms of uh, the traditional uh, uh, attire that uh, dress and also the, the dance itself, which is uh, very very unique as uh, compared to any. But the influence, of course, comes from the Middle East, from the Persian Gulf. I mean, that particular dance, when you look at how the Arabs dance nowadays and how the chakacha is done, there is a lot of similarities in it. I think both of you had, um, both of you, both uh, Rajab and you also had in the videos, uh, a dance, um, yeah. an actual idea of then music uh, and movement, uh, yeah. which I think is really very, is very, very critical. Um, uh, so Rajab, just you want to react to that? I think that uh, it really is uh, quite something. Yes, uh, I want to agree with what Dr. Piriji has just said. Uh, ancient Tarab, the performance of ancient Tarab, I could compare it with a ballet performance where everyone is usually seated and only the composer is on the stage. That is the setting of the uh, ancient Tarab. But in modern Tarab, I could compare the performance to a disco where the performer sings and everyone else is on stage, just like what Raphael has said. So there is also a big uh, difference between ancient and modern Tarab. Ancient Tarab was a bit slow, but modern Tarab is made for, for dancing because of the instruments, they are really uh, hyping and all. But also the message, just like uh, Dr. Purity has said, ancient Tarab was more of morals and uh, society issues. And even if it would have spoken about love, it would have been uh, hidden or has a very hidden meaning, just like what Raphael has said. But the modern Tarab uh, is not very much into morals. 
it speaks about love or uh, it's it's very sarcastic just like the the example Raphael used uh, whereby two women married by the same husband would use tarab to speak to each other in, in a festival so the modern tarab is more of speaking to each other uh, dancing and uh, you know love music uh, and not moral like it used to be uh, back then so what should i as an architect take away from this should i i mean there, there uh, i think that what you're saying are the intangible both in the arts and i think that i also was got this in the understanding about um, the storytelling as well is that it really reinvents itself it has improvisation and it takes on and that's its capacity to to reinvent itself and to have life uh, in for the future um and yet in architecture we rather frown on it we say this is not african this is influences from abroad uh what what would you say to the architects on that Bajam. Uh, I, I would say to the architects that uh, they should try and, uh, and 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 borrow like what Tarab and art does. I, it borrows some. It doesn't copy, but it borrows some ideas and uh, incorporates together with the original idea to come up with a masterpiece. So architects could also do that. Uh, the original idea and some bit from uh, outside to create to create a masterpiece. Yeah, and uh, Rafael, what would you say for the arts? Yeah, yeah, for for the okay for the arts, yes, uh, it's true, and and even uh, because you know visual arts is uh, even architecture is visual arts because uh, some of, most of the architectural uh, designs uh, derived from uh, some kind of a design, but I think it's good because uh, there was another university structure that I saw that uh, really had an infusion of the African. Uh, uh, African kind of uh, architecture, and uh, then uh, there's that mix of uh, the British and the colonial type, and so that kind of mix, I think, uh, brings out a better, uh, a better kind of uh, fusion, which I think architects should be able not to be, should be, should not be rigid. Uh, they should be, uh, <laughs> they should leave uh, that kind of uh, infusion to come in. Would you say that my comment on eye level was important? I mean, when, yeah, when yeah. we speak about music from Africa, so everybody's coming to us in Africa, yeah. as opposed to, shall we say, architecture, no, we're sort of like moving out to Europe. Is there, Do you feel that there is uh, this sort of um, uh, relationship or, or, or not? No, I think, I think there is that relationship because as you say, uh, the influences of music are coming from outside and we are, uh, I mean, we take the, the changes and do and, and enjoy the music. And, and even when you talk about the eye level, I think it's very correct because you're looking at it on a different uh, perspective, like uh, you, you, you want, want it to come and uh, you enjoy it. But in terms of architects, I think you look at it from a different uh, perspective, that's why. So, okay, so let's try and uh, we've just got a few more minutes to actually yeah. try to work out what we need to do. So everybody is going around the world is saying, yes, we have to integrate the tangible and intangible. Yet we yeah. have two, um, two different conventions. Um, there is in world heritage, there's also uh, associated values. Um, uh, if cultural landscapes, there's also events and beliefs, uh, but um, here we can see, just look at the numbers of people here. Uh, and again, what has happened? Women well, I know they they have great difficulty of the rest of the group and actually sort of relating to us over here. <laughs> so we have to reach out to the other people. Now, how are we going to then get them to say, okay, you want to have integrate tangible and intangible what would you uh, in music and what would you do in the visual arts to create this link, to create this bridge? Uh, is it something which I would say, like in many places, they, every building which comes about, there's been places called 1% for the arts. In other words, because people are not doing it um, voluntarily. So the government says, okay, 1% for the arts. Yeah. Or, this is ridiculous. No, we should then work out some other way by which we can then create a situation that in fact we begin to integrate therefore um, um, 
the intangible and intangible, and in that way, enrich the modern heritage of Africa. Rajab. Yes, uh, yes, Michael, just like uh, you've said, how can the tangible and intangible be incorporated? And in, in, in Tarab, uh, most specifically, I, I think they, they embrace it, like, for example, uh, uh, the modern Tara bands you find that they, they go to, to events, to wedding, to concerts, and maybe they have only five songs that have been composed by the band themselves. So what they do, they do covers of the ancient Tarabs. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so when, when, for example, in a wedding, when someone calls a band, they know they will get a, a, a mixture of both ancient and modern Tarab by the same band. Mm. Yeah. Rafael. Uh, I think uh, I agree with you that uh, there should be some uh, kind of uh, collaboration uh, or maybe infusing these two things. Look at an example of uh, a pictorial uh, exhibition, an exhibition that is uh, just on, uh, you know, pictorials. And then, but in that pictorial, there is that mix that uh, the pictures are showcasing heritage. And this is kind of a modern, modern uh, kind of technology that is coming up. And we find that, I think it's, it's quite possible for us to say, like uh, you say, like uh, this percentage should be here. It should be that kind of uh, uh, mix, that mix of uh, the ancient and the contemporary. And then it brings out a very interesting kind of, of art rather than uh, restricting it to only uh, one type of art. Mm. Yes. Okay, so, I mean, uh... Purity agrees on that one, but uh, what would you like to add to that? I mean, how could the museums, okay, actually take on board some activity which would then link the tangible and intangible, as opposed to just simply having one, an exhibition, and then two, a music event? Is there room for some uh, other initiative? Hello. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think what we, we, are, we are trying to do with the heritage hubs is already a way forward in terms of that, uh, because giving the youth the opportunities to just understand what's there. Like, for example, even when we had that workshop um, at the Swahili port, many youth did not even know what UNESCO is all about. So that was a good forum for them to understand what UNESCO is all about and what the two, the two conventions um, of intangible and tangible. And I think this is where we should be uh, focusing more on how can we be able to give the youth the platforms to listen and also to be part of some of the discussions which go on um, in, in most of these forums and organizations. So the Heritage Hub is one way, and then also giving the same youth the forum and the, the spaces to express themselves. Yeah, I, first of all, that's really, I mean, I just uh, saw that the, uh, the Swahili pot actually has the word inspiration, which is an important part. And when I think about Africa, we want with aspiration, I think we will only get aspiration when we have inspiration. So I think this is really where, where we can provide the spirit and the soul to the, to the stones and the wood and the and the sort of like the um, the mineral as opposed to the vegetable and the human. Shadrick. Yeah. So um, for me as an artist, how we can uh, how we can use that? Uh, actually, I've been doing it before because uh, I, I've had these people who have uh, who have been doing music approach me and tell me, I want you to do a graffiti for us to use the graffiti as a background. So I do this uh, kind of art, uh, which is used for the background of the music. So in that way, we have, in a way, we have come to use uh, the the visual art and together with the music now um, at one place. Like when it's being recorded, the artwork can also be seen. Then also some of my paintings are, are being used in uh, some kind of uh, music. Like we, we have some people who are shooting music, then they tell me we want to use this piece in our music. So for me, I find that that is a way of fusing the, of fusing music together with the uh, visual arts, yeah. Right. So, uh, Shahid, I know you've you've just come back and you missed out a little bit, but uh, uh, would you like to have a a word about how we can get the intangible 
and merge this with the tangible as opposed to everybody saying it and the mantra, but without actually um, coming up with a, a specific proposal. Uh, okay, yeah, you, you're asking the, 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 one of the most important questions. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's very hard to make, um, we, we've inherited these two categories called intangible and, and tangible. And, um, uh, uh, and, and we use it all the time. I suppose if we had a different way of, of talking about it from the beginning, we wouldn't be having this discussion. I'm really, uh, can't really uh, comment on, on, on how we can merge these two except to say that um, in the context of music where you can't have music without a tangible thing, a, a musical instrument or a person with a voice or a, a specific location or a specific place, all those are the tangible aspects. Uh, and the, the intangible is, is, is the music and, and the meaning behind the music or uh, sometimes the, the the shared meaning and sometimes the differential meaning because it, it's received in, in different ways. Uh, and, and that uh, perhaps music uh, and uh, performance in general um, illustrates why uh, this division between tangible and intangible is almost impossible to sustain. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going anything, any. Uh, throwing any further light on the subject than to say that, uh, yeah, the, the, the concepts are the problem. I don't know whether we can talk about these in, in, an, in, another, in another form. Uh, do we have another word for it? Um, and and that, that might be the challenge that we have, is, is how can we talk about this simultaneously without making this division? Mm. Okay, so I think it really it is, uh, it must then relate then to the senses. Um, I think this is the language it is. I can hear, I can see, I can touch. And it is then bringing the senses together, which is um, as an integrative activity. Uh, in other words, the more senses that are, are brought together, the richer then the experience. So therefore, if I only just touch it as a piece of architecture, as a building, well, I've touched it. But if I can also have uh, an event which is taking place where there is an art form, which I can, which has got also um, uh, an added value of seeing or listening to it, I would even sort of go and said, uh, okay, about how taste comes to it. I don't know. Anyway, but this is, this is an interesting challenge for us. I think that on the, my last note is that I really thank you um, all for, for enlightening me. I, I can't tell you how you've changed my life, my, my, my participation in, uh, in Mombasa in the, in the Swahili pod. Um, and I think that you've also come out with um, the most important thing about tradition is about the ownership of the community. And I think that that was a really important point. In other words, the, the modernism is about the individual. We now have the digital, uh, revolution empowers the individual there's no you know everybody now the individual's got the great power which then the community is now devoid and i think that uh, how in fact we are we're looking at is exactly how to take to re-engage the values of the community which are the tradition and then create and not see the syncretism as something affecting our identity, but in fact enriching our identity. So this might be a, might be a way forward. Anyways, I think we um, we are just about. Uh, if anybody would like to give uh, one last Arafat, I see that you finally crept back in here from the architects. No, he's not with us. So. I think that um, no, Mike. But I, I like this idea of sense that you that you're talking about. Sorry, uh, I like the idea of of sense as 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 something that encompasses both the tangible and intangible. And we might want to think about this word uh, sense, because uh, I mean, if if we're thinking of uh, 
the, the conventions and we replace tangible with intangible with asking us, tell us about the degree of senses that this particular heritage project invokes. Then you get away from this tangible intangible and we can then think about, so you then make an argument about how it, um, how it, uh, how it will or can or does um, uh, animate sense whether the sense is cerebral or whether it is smell or whether it is taste or hearing or feeling, um, that might be a different way of looking at it. Yeah. Thank you Thanks. for that. I think that um, another part of it would be uh, because Ikamos and have looked also the whole idea of spirit and feeling. And I think that this is what another part of it is that the only way of putting spirit and feeling is to put in what we currently speak about in tangible heritage. So I think that this is another another aspect which we have to give some thought to. But I think that uh, uh, I think you are um, you are the people who are at the front of this debate, um, uh, and uh, I think that both the music and the arts here are challenging the architecture. Great, we've, um, we've, uh, we'll be um, deleted from our, from our breakout room in, uh, in one minute. So we can leave and join back then the next session. Uh, and thank you, uh, really, um, I did uh, um, agree and spoke with Arafat and also Purity that we have to continue our, our workshop We've got um, a lot more to do, and I think that we're going to have a, a, a long journey together. So sure, I'm looking sure. forward to it. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to that, and the journey right. is long. Yes. Okay, I'm so pleased that you managed to we bring the Swahili pot to the the UCT um, uh, event. I mean, it's just really yeah, yeah. Uh, without it, uh, that have just simply spoken dumb yeah. the same. Yes, yes. And it has brought life in it. Right. But yeah, continue with it. And the, and the violin of Shadrick with his uh, art is the epitome of, the, of, the, uh, of working together. <laughs>